Wow, it's been a while. Uh, what's up, everybody? Will Borza here of Borza Mastering. It's the analog vlog. It's a vlog, analog. I wanted to make a video to update you because it's been like a cool minute since I've done anything like that and kind of go through some of the changes in the studio and the signal flow, kind of give you an idea of how things work now in uh, late 2022. This is my new space now. It's it's bigger, which is nice. So I moved back to Glendale in April 2022 into this, which is a two bedroom spot with nice amenities. One of the things I told Leslie, I had, I had ultimatums. If we we're gonna move back to LA, uh, it needs central air, uh, washer dryer, uh, a permanent place to park the car. Anyway, a couple other things, but but you know, this place fit all those bills. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Acoustic treatment. This is, uh, this is a new thing for me, actually. I've been doing this audio thing for like a decade and the first time I actually buy acoustic treatment is uh, three, four months ago. But this acoustic treatment is by LA Sound Panels and they've done a spectacular job. Just money. This room sounds phenomenal. I do have the door open behind you. Let me close that for a second. I feel like maybe there's some echo. Hang on. Okay, yeesh, is, is that any better? I hope so. Um, Cause the microphone's all the way up on the camera. It's, it's a bit away, so I'm sure you're hearing a lot of room. Speakers. Um, as you can see here, the Kali audios are still just phenomenal. I'm using them every day. But as you can also see here, I've got some Key 3 speakers. Uh, they sound good. They sound really good. <laughs> it's like this. It's like this. Sometimes, you, when you go out, you need an SUV, a really nice luxury SUV to take the whole family and pick up all the groceries and pick up all the kids and pick up all the, and, and you need a big car and it's gotta be nice and it's gotta be posh and it's gotta be full and, and sometimes you wanna get on a motorcycle and you wanna feel the wind on your face and you feel the wind on your chest and just <clears throat> Motorcycles, luxury SUV, you get it? There's absolutely a time and place for both. And having both in this room is a spectacular quick AB, so I can hear all parts of the equation. Headphones, I'm using these, uh, Odyssey or Audis, depending on where you are in the world and how you like to pronounce them. I'm sure they don't discriminate. Now, as for ergonomics, I have this room set up so that the in front of me, in front of the keys, you just have a computer screen, a mouse, a keyboard, the volume knob, and, and air space, right? Um, the analog equipment is a sidecar to my right. So if I need to dial something in quick, boom, 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 it's within arm reach, but for the most part, there's nothing hindering between me and the speakers. It's also the Callies, which are spectacular in the mid-range, are placed on top of the console. So analog equipment, which is all about the mid-range, is matched with the Callies, which is all about the mid-range and uh, match made in heaven there. So that's the space. Let's talk hardware. So the way we get in and out of the computer is the Lynx Hilo. The Hilo is essentially my digital backbone. It has a send receive to my converters. It sends output to the Grace M905 monitor control. It sends an optical signal out to the TT Electronics Clarity. Also has a headphone amp on it. It's an absolute workhorse. I think if I had to start from scratch, the Hilo would be the first thing I would purchase. It just does everything. Hilo digital backbone, manly analog backbone, conveniently called the backbone. On the backbone, there are three input selects. There's a left, right swap, input and output gains, polarity flip. And then basically it acts like a input strip like you'd see in a DAW, except it's analog. And then you have a bunch of analog inserts that you put on uh, inserts one through eight. Inserts two and three can be in either left, right, or mid side mode. Four and five can be swapped so that five is in front of four. And eight can be placed either before or after the output gains. So for example, placing a limiter on that eighth slot 
would make a lot of sense because you could really choose to drive hard into that limiter. Currently, my back CQ, which lives directly above the backbone, is not plugged in. Why? Because I really just don't like it. I'm sorry, you know, a bunch of people love the backs. It's just, every time I try it, I end up bypassing it and liking that sound better. I want to love it. I've wanted to love it for years. I just don't, and I need to sell it. I'm sorry. Converters, love the converters. The EQ, it's not my jam. So placed on input two is the Thermionic Culture Phoenix Mastering Plus compressor, which can be operated, again, in left-right mode or mid-side mode. Um, I especially like the mid-side mode because this particular circuit actually pushes a lot more gain into the side signal, so the way that it hits the unit um, will actually saturate the sides more than it saturates the mids, uh, creating a more vibrant side signal. So you get like extra width just by having it in mid-side mode without adding extra gain. Super cool thing. Inserts four and five. Four is the Manly Massive Passive Mastering Edition, and insert five is the Manly Slam Mastering Edition. Uh, so those two can be reversed, and uh, those are a lot of fun. We'll, we'll touch on those a little bit in a moment. And lastly, the Rupert Neve Designs Master Bus Processor is insert number eight, which could be pre or post the output gain. So if you want to slam that limiter, you absolutely can. All right, let's talk about the Phoenix for a second. Um, the really cool thing that I love about this Phoenix is the box tone. You can actually take the threshold and turn it off and just run this thing as essentially a tube lineup and it's so thick and juicy and tuby, and the box tone is marvelous. Oh yeah, and also it's a compressor. It's a very Moo style, so in the lineage of Fairchild, um, where this differs, the Fairchild, you have one through six time constraints, and that affects both attack and release. This separates out the attack and release. It also has a side chain circuit built in, so you can choose to sort of ignore the, the low lows or a lot of the lows, um, depending on which position you put it in. I more or less left it in the middle position on day one, and I've I've never changed it since. Like every time I try a different position, I'm just like, nah, that's not it. Moving on to four and five, you have the massive, passive, and the slam. So you choose to either massively slam or slam massively. Um, we all know the benefits of sometimes EQing then compressing to get a more cohesive glued sound as opposed to compressing and then EQing so that your EQ choices kind of take you further because the compression has already already brought up those low level details. So it's really nice to have these two set up in, in a switch back and forth sort of way. The massive passive, um, what can I say about this unit? The, if you know, you know. That's what I can say. I would buy this EQ first if I was starting over again, except I wouldn't have anything to plug it into. So like, and I still might buy it first just because, because they, they, it just literally, it sits there and it goes up in value. Like this EQ is, it's the king of EQs or maybe it's the queen regent. It's just, it's, if you've never tried one, do yourself a favor and get you some. As for the slam, the slam is a bit more esoteric. I, I came down to the decision of like, do I want to get the slam or do I want to get the Shadow Hills Mastering Compressor? Uh, because both are similarly priced and both are a combination of Opto and FET compressors in one unit. Ultimately, I decided to go with a Manly Slam because one, I'm a Manly fanboy. And two, it can be a bit more transparent. The box tone of the slam is a bit more subtle than the box tone of the uh, Shadow Hills. Sometimes you just need a little, not a lot. And uh, if you're gonna turn on the Shadow Hills, you're getting a lot, which some people love. So to each their own, but f manly fanboy, manly slam, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous unit. It starts with an optical compressor, which is like very LA2AE. Um, with variable ratio, and um, you can press the press in the threshold where you want it to go. Another side chain on that one, so you can do the full spectrum, or just you know ignore the low end, or actually weigh the high end higher if you want to use it more as like a uh, sibilance uh, reducer, which is which is super cool. And then on the FET side, um, the FET compressor, I'm sure it sounds wonderful, <laughs> but. I actually haven't really used it much. I have 
fallen in love with the analog clipper that was built into this unit, giving the signal a little bit of opto hug, followed by some extraordinarily violent and vibrant clipping is just, it's so good. <laughs> Uh, another one that just must be heard and must be tried, and I know it's expensive, but if you can get your hands on one, give it a shot. It, it, uh, it was life affirming. And moving on lastly then to uh, insert number eight, the Neve MBP. This unit I've had for a very, very long time. You can see some of the earlier videos, the earliest videos on this channel are me playing with uh, just like a pure two and the MBP and that's it. It's a spectacular unit and I almost never dial in settings on it because the recall, it would be kind of a pain because it's not like clicky pots, it's like bumpy pots. And there's a lot of really intricate things. So I typically just, it's either in or it's out or it's like silk blue or silk red on or off. Or if I do dial it in, like, you know, silk on at nine o'clock. But even just turned on with a compressor bypass, there's a gorgeous transformer that it goes through that just makes things sound more expensive and more 3D. It gives it gives depth and dimension to a mix just on, like not even with the compressor button turned off. It's magic. <laughs> you get what you pay for. So those are my choices for tone, dynamics, color, and control in the analog world. And uh, you know, we've done a whole video here talking about converters, but I'll touch on it just for a moment. Since moving down here, I, uh, I actually have lent out the Pure 2, uh, so that's on loan right now. The Dangerous Convert 2 and Convert 80 Plus are my daily drivers. They are the only converters that I'm using at the moment because I just kind of kept choosing them over the others over and over and over again. And I'm like, well, let's simplify my life. <laughs> um, a couple noteworthy things on the AD plus side. Uh, it has a transformer button on it, which is super hi-fi and nice. And you can just turn it on and it sounds great. Or you can crank it up and it sounds great. It's not on everything. Um, I'd say it works for me maybe one out of 10 times, but that one out of 10 times that it does work, it's exactly what the song needed. And it's like, oh yeah, where have you been all my life? Um, oh, and clipping, you know, it sounds good. It's a good clipping box. Some converters don't clip well, like the Hilo, do not clip that thing, you will not be happy. The 80 plus, it likes to be clipped. Last but not least, on the analog side of things is my monitor control, the Grace M905. I love it. Um, there's really only a couple of choices for high-end monitor controls, and this is the one I chose. My number one reason, uh, even if it is a silly one, is that this monitor control does not click when you turn the volume button, and the clicking of the other ones in the high-end space as you turned the volume knob drove me insane. So as petty as that might be, that's the number one reason why I chose the Grace over the others. Uh, but also other things about the Grace are just spectacular. You have three choices of speaker input. It's endlessly programmable to do anything you need in terms of referencing. Um, and I have different points in my analog console going into it. I have, you know, at the point of D to A, I have the return out of the backbone pre-AD, and of course I have the return from the DAW after uh, everything has been processed. So I can really listen with just moving a couple clicks on the grace to different very crucial points in the chain, gain compensate them, and you know, do whatever needs to be done. You can listen to the mono channels, the difference channel, dim, mute, talk back, it's, it's, it's world class. It's wonderful. I love it. If I was starting all over again, I would I'd probably still buy that Lynx first, but maybe the Grace second. I don't know. It's super good. Okay, so that's the analog stuff. Now let's dive in the box and talk about software. So wouldn't it be nice if us mastering engineers could just have one piece of software, digital audio workstation, that did everything? But I don't think I've met a single mastering engineer that's done it all in one program. So when it comes to analysis and just dealing with lots of files, I will use Myriad. 
Um, it's also great for batch editing. If you've used it, you know its power. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it's currently available or not. If it is, grab it because it'll change your life. For all the mastery things like uh, metadata and DDPs and whatnot, um, up until just recently, I was using HOFA, which um, is probably more than enough for everybody. But I did transition from HOFA into WaveLab, at least partially. Uh, WaveLab's got a bit of a learning curve, but I think it's going to be wonderful once I have the things in place that I need to have in place. Uh, I've already figured out how to make DDPs and stuff in it and embed metadata uh, in a very cool way. So that aspect of it, plus the advanced um, sequencing abilities, as well as extraordinary metering tools, um, makes WaveLab a A plus in my book. So I'm very much looking forward to getting more into that. For restoration, for forensics, for all that good stuff, of course, it's the one we all know and love, Isotope RX. Uh, I'm still on eight, so maybe I should upgrade this thing, but lazy. So eight's fine and it's doing well and maybe I'll get 10, whatever. Lastly, for all the analog capture and actually like processing of the sound, the thing that people think mastering is all about when they don't realize that it's like 90% metadata and admin and QC and distro prep, but just, just that one little portion there that gets romanticized of making things sound better. For that, I use Reaper. I can't find anything that's more flexible. It's a sandbox in a DAW. It's a DAW that's a sandbox. It's endlessly malleable to do exactly what I need it to do. And uh, there's so many just built-in weird esoteric things that just make so much sense from a mastering perspective. I would be lost. No, I wouldn't be lost, but I would be like, 10 times slower in any other DAW because of the, the cool things that I've gotten Reaver to do. Plugins. Uh, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but I would say that some of my favorites right now would be, of course, FabFilter. Absolutely world-class plugins all around. Nothing bad I can say about them. Ozone. Ozone 10 just came out. That one's fun. I really don't like the stabilizer, but we can talk about that in another video. Another one that I love a ton of the stuff they do. Plugin Alliance. Plugin Alliance is so cool. They have such good plugins. They're analog emulations. You look at them on Plugin Doctor and it's like, oh yeah, that is what analog looks like. That's cool. Here's a weird one. If you don't have it, you should give it. It's only like $15. Klanghelm Voomt. It's a VU meter. It's literally there out open when I open a project template for the very first time. It's, it's a constant on my screen. Seeing the way a piece of music makes a VU meter dance is extraordinarily insightful. Another one that I'm extraordinarily impressed with right now, especially when it comes to like looking like analog and sounding like analog in the box is Tone Projects. Their Unisom compressor and their Kelvin are so phenomenal. My only qualm is that it's like a tweaker's paradox. You will get lost in uh, opening up all the different extra menus and like trying to adjust the settings of your compressor instead of just attack ratio uh, release and threshold. Did I that was a weird order to say them in, wasn't it? Honorable mentions to, I guess, uh, Oxford Inflator, uh, DDMF Magic Death Eye, Plugin Doctor is... Um, man, revealing, you know? Um, actually seeing what your plugins are doing, not just believing the uh, marketing hype around them, made me stop using certain plugins forever and made me start using certain plugins that I never gave a second thought to when I first uh, tried them. So that's uh, that's sort of the state of, of Boards of Mastering right now. If you saw the space, you saw the hardware, the software, um, I'm very happy to be here. And thank you for watching. If you like this video and you'd like to see more of this kind of stuff, uh, please like, share, and comment on the video. It's the thing that the, uh, the algorithm loves and it helps out a lot. So you, wherever you are, have a lovely day, wonderful time, good to see you, See you in the next one. Peace.